darkness of his life had been. How in eloquent silence I walked the girl home, and how when I took leave of her, her parting remarks scorched my soul and appeared to blister me all over. She said that my horse was a fine, capable animal, and I must have taken great comfort in him in my time, but that if I would take along some milk tickets next time and appear to deliver them at the various halting places, it might expedite his movements a little. There was a coolness between us after that. In one place in the island of Hawaii, we saw a laced and ruffled cataract of limpid water leaping from a sheer precipice 1,500 feet high. But that sort of scenery finds its staunchest ally in the arithmetic rather than in spectacular effect. If one desires to be so stirred by a poem of nature wrought in the happily co commingled graces of picturesque rocks, glimpsed distances, foliage, color, shifting lights and shadows, and falling water, then the tears almost came into his eyes, so potent is the charm exerted. He need not go away from America to enjoy such an experience. The Rainbow Fall in Watkins Glen, New York, on the Erie Railway, is an example. It would recede into pitiable insignificance if the callous tourist drew an arithmetic on it, but left to compete for the honors simply on scenic grace and beauty, the grand, the august, and the sublime being barred the contest. It could challenge the old world and the new to produce its peer. In one locality on our journey, we saw some horses that had been born and reared on top of the mountains, above the range of running water, and consequently they had never drunk that fluid in their lives, but had been always accustomed to quenching their thirst by eating dew-laden or shower-wetted leaves. And now it was destructively funny to see them sniff suspiciously at a pail of water, and then put in their noses and try to take a bite out of the fluid, as if it were a solid. Finding it liquid, they would snatch away their heads and fall to trembling, snorting, and showing other evidences of fright. When they became convinced at last that the water was friendly and harmless, they thrust in their noses up to their eyes, brought out a mouthful of the water, and proceeded to chew it complacently. We saw a man coax, kick, and spur one of them five or ten minutes before he could make it cross a running stream. It spread its nostrils, distended its eyes, and trembled all over, just as horses customarily do in the presence of a serpent. And for aught, I knew it thought the crawling stream was a serpent. In due course of time, our journey came to an end at Kwahi, usually pronounced Tuahi, and before we find fault with this elaborate orthographical method of arriving at such an unobstentatious result, let us lop off the ug from our word though. I made his horse I made this horseback trip on a mule. I paid ten dollars for him at Kau Kahu, added four to get him shod rode him two hundred miles, and then sold him for fifteen dollars. I marked the circumstance with a white stone in the absence of chalk, for I never saw a white stone that a body could mark anything with, though out of respect for the ancients I have tried it often enough. For up to that date, and date it was the first strictly commercial transaction I had ever entered into and come out winner, we returned to Honolulu and from thence sailed to the island of Maui, and spent several weeks there very pleasantly. I still remember with a sense of indolent luxury a picnicking excursion up a romantic gorge there called the Io Valley. The trail lay along the edge of a brawling stream in the bottom of a gorge, a shady route, for it was well roofed with the verdant domes of forest trees. Through openings in the foliage we glimpsed picturesque scenery, that revealed ceaseless changes and new charms with every step of our progress. Perpendicular walls from one to three thousand feet high guarded the way and were sumptuously plumed with varied foliage in places and in places swathed in waving ferns. Passing shreds of cloud trailed their shadows across these shining fronts, 
molting them with blots. Billowy masses of white vapor hid the turreted summits, and far above the vapor swelled a background of gleaming green crags and cones that came and went through the veiling mists, like islands drifting in a fog. Sometimes the cloudy curtain descended till half the canyon wall was hidden, then shredded gradually away till only airy glimpses of the ferny front appeared through it, then swept aloft and left it glorified in the sun again. Now and then as our position changed, rocky bastions swung out from the wall, a mimic ruin of castellated ramparts and crumpling towers clothed with mosses and hung with garlands of swaying vines, and as we moved on they swung back again and hid themselves once more in the foliage. Presently a verdure-clad needle of stone a thousand feet high stepped out from behind a corner and mounted guard over the mysteries of the monument of the valley. It seemed to me that if Captain Cook needed a monument, here was one ready-made. Therefore, why not put up his sign here and sell out the venerable coconut stump? But the chief pride, pride of Maui is her dead volcano of Heliakala, which means translated the house of the sun. We climbed a thousand feet up the side of this isolated colossus one afternoon, then camped, and next day climbed the remaining nine thousand feet and anchored on the summit where we built a fire and froze and roasted by turns all night. With the first pallor of dawn we got up and saw things that were new to us. Mounted on a commanding pinnacle we watched nature work her silent wonders. The sea was spread before was spread abroad on every hand, its tumbled surface seeming only wrinkled and dimpled in the distance. A broad valley below appeared like an ample checkerboard, its velvety green sugar plantations alternating with dun squares of barrenness, and groves of trees diminished to mossy turf. Beyond the valley were mountains picturesquely grouped together, but bear in mind, we fancied that we were looking up at these things, not down. We seemed to sit in the bottom of a symmetrical bowl ten thousand feet deep, with the valley and the skirting sea lifting away into the sky above us. It was curious, and not only curious, but aggravating, for it was ha having our trouble all for nothing. To climb ten thousand feet toward heaven, and then have to look up at our scenery. However, we had to be content with it and make the best of it. For all we could do, for all we could do, we could not coax our landscape down out of the clouds. Formerly, when I had read an article in which Poe treated of this singularly singular fraud perpetrated upon the eye by isolated great altitudes, I had looked upon the matter as an invention of his own fancy. I have spoken of the outside view, but we had an inside one, too. There was the yawning dead crater into which we now and then tumbled rocks, half as large as a barrel from our perch, and saw them go careering down the almost perpendicular sides, bouncing three hundred feet at a jump, kicking up dust clouds wherever they struck, diminishing to our view as they sped further into distance, growing invisible, finally and only betraying their course by faint little puffs of dust, and coming to a halt at last in the bottom of the abyss, two thousand five hundred feet down from where they started. It was magnificent sport. We wore ourselves out at it. The crater of Vesuvius, as I have been remarked, as I have before remarked, is a modest pit about a thousand feet deep and three thousand in circumference. That of Kilauea is somewhat deeper and ten miles in circumference. But what are either of them compared to the vacant stomach of Halakalea? I will not offer any figures of my own, but give official ones those of Commander Wilkes, USN, who surveyed it and testifies that it is 27 miles in circumference. If it had a level bottom, it would make a fine sight for a city like London. It must have afforded a spectacle worth contemplating in the old days, when its furnaces gave full rein to their anger. 
Presently, vagrant white clouds came drifting along, high over the sea and the valley. Then they came in couples and groups and imposing squadrons. Gradually joining their forces, they banked themselves solidly together a thousand feet under us, and totally shut out land and ocean. Not a visage of anything was left in view, but just a little of the rim of the crater, circling away from the pinnacle whereon we sat for a ghostly procession of wanderers from the filmy hosts without had drifted through a chasm in the crater wall and filled round and round and gathered and sunk and blended together till the abyss was stored to the brim with a fleecy fog. Thus 